Um, we are running 15 minutes late, so we better get started. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, invite Dr. Uh, Jin Miao Chen and uh, Professor Indranil Mukhopadhyay to chair this session. Um, I have a, an announcement to make for those of you who are chairing sessions and giving talks. Um, please stop by the registration desk uh, and meet with Esther. She has an envelope for you. Even if you have not given your talk, you're welcome to meet with her. Uh, and if you have collected the envelope, then you don't need to go to her. But if you have not, please do. And these uh, also pertain to lightning talks and people who are participating in the panel discussion and all of that, uh, including the session chairs. Thank you very much. Let's get started. Hello, welcome back to uh, the section three, which will be computational approaches re uh, relevant to atlasing. Uh, the speakers will be a uh, girl Gao. He is from. He's a principal investigator from Peking University. Uh, he can't make uh, his trip to uh, India, so he'll be giving his talk online. Okay. Okay. Uh, sure. So, uh, hello everyone from Beijing in winter. Uh, sorry uh, uh, for the you know uh, what you talk, but uh, uh, I like to thanks for the organizer and the committee for the great opportunity to present our work, our recent work on modeling uh, cell regulatory maps. So, uh, so we human are essentially an assembling of trillions of cells. Most of those cells share a common genome, but different expression and different phenotypes. So the gene expression is a uh, highly regulated processes which involve the multiple genetic and epigenetic regulatory layers and the sophisticated interaction between uh, those layers. And uh, since the discovery of uh, transcription factor 60 years ago, we now have um, we now have known that the gene expression is a nonlinear. Uh, uh, hierarchical and combinatorial processes. So our idea is to model such a uh, complex system through uh, generative models or computationally. We will try to estimate the full data prob uh, probability distribution from inputted data directly. As you may expect, the such task is hard, as in reward we usually do not, and, and actually we cannot have the full data size as input. So we need an additional assumption. Okay, so we need an additional assumption that there is a low dimensional rule site behind the high dimensional observations. So such rule site cannot be observed directly. But we can make our model learn from the observation, the data directly, as the root site is exactly the site which generated the, uh, those observations. So just like what the ChatGPT does, okay, the ChatGPT does not keep all inputs uh, text as is, but it just tries to learn the rules of human speaking language so it can you know apparently understand what we say and respond accordingly so here we are going to build a model to learn the language of cell regulation or the cell regulatory language model and uh, uh, we begin from the single cell uh, trans, uh, 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 a single cell RNA seq from the uh, uh, transcriptome. So basically, we model the um, observed single cell expression data X uh, as being generated from a lower dimensional latent space U by a particular transformation presented by encoder and decoder neuronal networks. So the model can handle batch effect effectively. As a, a, a pancreatic data site shown here, the model is able to align cell of the same type 
from distinct disk size correctly, even if the original disk size shows strong batch effects. Further benchmarks also you know, demonstrate that um, the model itself um, is uh, the best over other um, uh, um, uh, measures. But which is, you know, especially true for more complex multi-level batch effects, which uh, is part of the uniqueness of our model. For example, here we actually have six different human pancreatic disk size. Some contains multiple donors. So that just leads to a hierarchical batch effects. The classical strategy for batch correction does not necessarily correct the cross donor effects because those effects are just within the disk site instead of the cross disk site. But our model can just work well and effectively correct both inter and intra disk site batch effect. And we further extended our model to multi-omics cases. So especially we incorporate a dedicated graph autoencoder to model the regulatory uh, graph. So within the graph, uh, each node represented a functional unit like uh, you know, a gene or a promoter which uh, uh, corresponded to a, a type peak. Uh, and those nodes are interconnected uh, with age, which represented the regulatory relationship. So from the perspective of the cells, the intermodality feature embedding serve as a unified coordinated system and provide the necessary guidance for align those uh, um, um, uh, data across different modalities. And meanwhile, the correlation structure in the aligned data can also be used to um, infer the regulatory uh, structure. So mathematically, in addition to the generative architecture we used before, we incorporate a graph component to model the interactions across regulatory layers. So each with a distinct modality and uh, the graph itself to be used as both a uh, um, regularization and a notebook for integrating uh, regulatory inferences. And the model works just well for you know, the regular uh, two omics integration um, and consistently show the lowest uh, alignment error as well as the uh, highest cell typing resolution and uh, you know, take the mixing uh, over other suitable arts. Uh, but the uniqueness of the uh, model of the glue is it can work with uh, uh, more complex uh, cases such as uh, uh, triple omics integration, such as uh, you know the uh, RNA attack and uh, mesolome. So, as the figure shown, uh, the glue made an accurate alignment and supervisedly across the three different omics disk sites which were generated by three different lives at the three different years. And as what I mentioned before, the incorporation of the graph component, uh, graph component uh, not only provides the necessary guidance, but also serve as a basic uh, for the regulatory inferences with uh, several relevant uh, information integrated. So, and when we apply the glue to uh, PBMC this site uh, uh, with both RNA and attack, we can get a complete TF target uh, network, which successfully pinpoint many important transformation factors like the um, uh, EBF1, the uh, uh, um, uh, SP, uh, SP1 and the PAX5. And, uh, and, you know, in 
market salary audience like the human. A cell has to work with others for um, functional um, profit. So uh, for a comprehensive regulatory mind, we also need to incorporate the spatial context of cells into the picture. So we have slide. Here we um, use the graph again, but each cell is just modeled as a graph node and the spatial uh, um, uh, correlation structure are modeled as the edge. So to capture the local and the global uh, spatial uh, topology, uh, we apply the multi-layer graph convolution to propagate and aggregate information between cells and their neighbors on the graph. And you know, just as before, in, we incorporate an adversary matching component to deal with the differences in this size, resolution, feature space, and you know, the batch effect. And in the benchmark, we have three representative data sites from you know, the 10x to show seek, which cover a wide range of uh, throughput uh, resolution. Well, you can see um, all those or uh, uh, all those tools uh, works pretty well for 10 eyes. The slide is the only one uh, um, which uh, achieves the best performance across all technologies. But the real power of the slide is its unique capacity to work on heterogeneous data. For example, here we use the slide to integrate spatial attack with spatial uh, transto uh, uh, transatomic data for mice, uh, for mice uh, 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 fetal's heart. So even with the big differences in the resolution, the 20 versus uh, 0.2 uh, is a uh, um, uh, 100x differences. The slide successfully aligns them in different you know, modality. And uh, the follow-up um, regulatory inferences uh, also identified the uh, key transfer factors for heart development. And uh, actually, uh, the slide can um, also do this um, uh, for more than pairwise. The slide can do this over more than um, two and three and four uh, slides. So we actually apply the slide to slides uh, at eight different time points across the early mice development. And uh, we can actually reconstruct the spatial temporal development processes, including the developmental uh, uh, dynamics of many uh, important organs, such as uh, uh, liver, the brain, and the lung. And uh, I'd like to uh, emphasize that all operations here is unsupervised. So you do not need any you know, pre precise and just like the algorithm do it uh, to each other. And uh, for example, the slide can accurately capture the merging and the migration event happened uh, during the mice kidney development between the uh, 11.5 and the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, 12.5. But the other methods just failed to handle you know, such a uh, large spatial rearrangement. So, in summary, we believe that um, by rationally designed generative models, we can take full advantage of single-cell multi-omics data 
to decipher the regulatory map and further decoding the functional genome effectively and efficiently. So um, uh, uh, all those codes are you know, just uh, freely available online and, and uh, just feel free to give a try. And I'd like to end my talk by uh, thanks for my um, great students and postdocs, uh, such as uh, uh, Dr. Cao Zhijie, uh, uh, Dr. Xia Chen Rui, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Li Jingyi, uh, as well uh, as other uh, peoples uh, which make those things possible. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Gergal, for the very nice talk. We learned a lot about graph, new networks, and the generative models. Any questions from the audience? Okay, I have one question. So, uh, just now we saw Slack can integrate uh, two different omics. One omix is measured by stereosic, another omix is measured by another technology. I, I can't uh, capture the name uh, correctly, but these two omics have very different uh, resolution. One has uh, a spatial resolution of 20 micrometer, but the other one has a sub-micrometer resolution. So how does the algorithm uh, handle these uh, different spatial uh, resolutions across omics when doing this integration? Uh, sorry, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I fully get it because you know, um, <laughs> You know the the, the um, um, uh, uh, but but anyway, uh, do you actually refer to this? Oh, maybe I, I repeat the question. Okay. Okay. So, uh, for your multi or mixed spatial integration, there is one example okay. wherein you integrate a uh, stereotic data with another uh, or mixed measure with another technology. And these two technology have very different spatial resolution. Okay, so oh, uh, oh, okay. How do you handle uh, this as different spatial resolution when integrating them? Okay, so uh, I believe the question is uh, about the uh, spatial integration uh, across the spatial attack and the uh, spatial uh, RNA seq, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, so um, uh, that's a good question, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, as just uh, uh, what I mentioned uh, before, the uh, you know uh, the one design goal of the um, uh, spatial alignment and the integration algorithm the slide is to um, um, align different. Um, heterogeneous data across the different resolution, across the different technologies, and across the different modalities. So the basic idea uh, is, is, to, is we uh, try to model the um, uh, spatial relationship along with the uh, uh, cell identity, uh, which uh, is represented by the uh, uh, expression and uh, 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 you know, the uh, attack peak and the, the molecular features as a, a unified graph. So uh, the differences in technologies such you know, uh, as the uh, um, uh, uh, resolution and uh, the um, uh, a number of genes detected uh, could be abstracted as a, a, a unified graph because the graph itself could 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 be uh, adapted and uh, aligned by an uh, adversary component, uh, which will try to uh, matching the uh, 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 slice one, uh, you know, the attack slice uh, with the uh, uh, slice two, the uh, RNA slice. By matching to graph, so we, so so we actually uh, work over two graphs instead of two uh, physical slides, which could effectively avoid the complexity 
of the uh, different resolution and the different modality. Thank you very much for the very nice answer. Yeah, so let's uh, thank uh, Prof. Gergao for the very nice uh, presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. bye bye. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's you. welcome the second uh, speaker, uh, Grace Yeo. Grace Yeo is a principal investigator from GIS, Genome Institute of Singapore. Um, hi, um, thank you for the introduction um, and for the invitation to speak. So my name is Grace Yeo. I'm a GIS fellow in the domain of the domain of spatial and single cell systems in the Genome Institute of Singapore uh, under Dr. Sean Prabhakar. And today I'll be sharing a little bit about one of our ongoing projects where we've been looking at mapping the colorectal cancer tumor microenvironment. And I'm going to discuss a little bit about some of the computational pipelines and um, challenges and ideas that we have um, for this project. So colorectal cancer is clinically and molecularly a very heterogeneous disease. And it wasn't until we had single cell RNA sequencing that we were really able to start to appreciate just the diverse number of cell types that really make up colorectal cancer. And so in the past few years, we've had these atlasing studies, uh, which basically gave us a lot of insight into the many different types of cells um, that are present, um, that make up not just the cancer, but also the tumor microenvironment um, and which we can then relate to particular clinical phenotypes. So as an example, um, in this work that was um, uh, spearheaded by my colleague Jonito at GIS, where we subclustered epithelial cells in colorectal cancer, we found that there were two very distinct clusters that we call the intrinsic consensus molecular subtypes, ICMS2 and ICMS3, that could be described to have very distinct genetic, um, transcriptomic, and regulatory profiles. And when we used this to reclassify colorectal cancer into five different subtypes, uh, what we found was that these subtypes could be associated to the different clinical phenotypes, such as survival and immunotherapy response. But not just that, they were also had very um, distinct um, tumor microenvironment profiles. But of course, how you know, do the cells that, are, that form the tumor and form the tumor microenvironment actually give rise to these clinical phenotypes? I think this is something that we still have very limited understanding of. Um, and as other speakers have alluded to today, maybe one of the problems is that in single cell RNA sequencing, we've lost a lot of spatial information about how the cells are um, organized within the tumor. We've lost information also about the signaling and molecular gradients that are present within the tumor. And you know, perhaps another source of complexity in um, doing these studies is that of intratumor heterogeneity, which we know um, poses a, um, a, a big source in um, therapeutic resistance. And so while single cell RNA sequencing has you know, really uh, paved the way towards our understanding of this molecularly very complex disease by allowing us to take apart the car and you know, look at each of the components one by one, uh, what we hope with spatial omics is that we can take a look at how these parts actually come together to form functional un no units such as um, the wheel or um, the chasis or, um, you know, and so on and so forth. And so in this work, uh, my colleagues Bo and Yurika carried out spatial omics um, on a large cohort of 33 patients and 74 samples. We've uh, looked at over 6 million cells that we've collected from patients um, over diverse clinical and molecular subtypes. Um, and we looked at both fresh frozen and FFPE tissues um, that we have access to via our clinical collaborator, Dr. Ian Tan uh, from Singapore General Hospital, National Cancer Center, Singapore. Um, and we looked at two technologies in particular, um, Cyclic Fish, um, which was developed by Chen Kok Hao, who is also a GIS, um, and that Bo and Eureka optimized for fresh frozen tissues, um, and also 10x um, Xenium, uh, which we use for FFPE tissues. Um, and well, okay, so I'm a computational biologist, so um, you know, then the question is, what do we get as output from these technologies? Well, actually, it looks quite similar to a single cell. We get this cell by gene matrix. Um, but in addition to that, we actually get two or sometimes maybe three rows of information, the X, Y, Z coordinates of where the cells live in physical space. And then we can start to ask you know, interesting questions of, you know, we can project ourselves into expression space, which is what we usually do in single cell RNA sequencing. 
But now we can also map them back into physical space. And then the question becomes, how do these two expression spaces um, uh, 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 co correlate? How are they related to each other? Um, but first, um, you know, this is still atlasing, so we're going to go to cell typing first. Um, uh, in cell typing, we are still using an iterative subclustering pipeline that's very similar to what's being used in single cell RNA sequencing studies. We identify major and then minor subtypes. Um, we have reference to single cell atlases that have already been um, analyzed and annotated by my colleagues, Jonito and Varavan. Um, and then, but there are key differences um, in, for spatial, and I'll just highlight three. So one is in pre-processing. Um, so because we're using imaging-based technologies, our raw data is images rather than sequencing reads. Um, and that means that the pre-processing steps instead of realignment are things like spot calling and cell segmentation. And these, you know, I think are important to be cognizant of because they um, introduce different kinds of errors um, into the analysis downstream. Um, we also want to include spatial information into our cell typing pipeline, and we do that through um, Banksy, which was developed by Vipo and Nigel, uh, that was recently accepted. Um, and um, in downstream analysis, um, we also want to go beyond just simple uh, abundance analysis as well. I'll say simple, but... Um, we also want to do spatial specific analysis such as uh, co-localization or the discovery of new spatial neighborhoods. Um, so when we applied this pipeline, uh, we were able to identify all the major uh, cell types that we expect to find in CRC. Um, and then we were also uh, able to, when we subclustered, for example, just the fibroblasts, identify uh, fibroblast subtypes um, within our spatial data that express uh, distinct markers and um, probably have very distinct functions. Um, we can look at the correlation of the aggregated profiles across the spatial technologies and with single cell. And here we see a really nice correlation between the spatial technologies as well as single cell. Um, and this is a bit surprising, or a really good, really nice result actually, because you know we ha do have a limited panel with spatial data constituting only a few hundred genes. The next question you might ask is, can we recapitulate some of the findings that we had in single cell? And the answer is yes. So if we look at the gene signatures um, that were associated to these two intrinsic epithelial subtypes that we found, and then we project our spatial data onto them. Again, in our spatial data, we're able to cleanly separate the ICMS2 and ICMS3 patients, and they express the markers that we expect. So now I've tried to convince you that, you know, our spatial data is concordant with single cell. But of course, you know, the question becomes, you know, what can we learn from the spatial data? And I think, you know, the best way to start with that is to uh, have a first a qualitative description of what does the normal colon look like in the first place? Well, in the normal colon, we have this really nice organization where, uh, in this crypt villa structure, where you know, and right down at the bottom, we have these stem cells that, um, as, they, as they differentiate, they rise through the transit amplifying zone all the way to the top of the villas, and then they start to adopt um, specific functions in absorption and secretion. And if we look, take our cell types that we've identified and then map them back into the physical space, we can see this exact pattern um, happening. Um, in contrast, in colon cancer, um, the structure, ar architecture actually becomes completely disorganized and the uh, signaling pathway that you know, maintains homeostasis and regeneration becomes very noisy and very fuzzy instead. And we can also see this uh, qualitatively in our data. We can take the same cell types that I showed you just now or maybe the analogous cell types and project them back on. And you can see we've lost all of the really nice um, architecture that we have in the normal colon. But at the same time, um, you know, the, the spatial distribution of these epithelial subtypes are still non-random. And so the question becomes, you know, how do we actually quantify and describe this? Well, one way is through domain findings. So we do this using Banksy, which uh, I previously mentioned was um, developed by Vipo and Nigel at GIS. And the idea here is that when we're doing clustering, for example, we want to consider not only the expression of its individual cell, but also the expression of its neighborhood. And so uh, we also have this tuning parameter, um, lambda, that basically says how much attention do we want to pay to our own neighborhood, uh, to our own expression versus our neighboring expression. Um, and when we apply this to our data, uh, we found that um, when lambda is low, we're uh, identifying cell types. But when lambda is high, um, we start to see these cell types coalescing into these um, 
biologically coherent um, spatial neighborhoods. So for example, we can identify a neutrophil-rich re region that contains lots of neutrophils and also cancer-associated fibroblasts are expressing cytokines and upregulating uh, NF-kappa-beta signaling. Um, and also hypoxia-high neighborhoods that are uh, mostly enriched for mature enterocytes. Um, another uh, type of analysis we can do is uh, looking at co-localization and mutual exclusion, where the question here becomes, you know, given two cell types, are they enriched or depleted um, in the relative neighborhood of each other? And we're going to do this using spatial autocorrelation. Um, there are three simple steps. First, you define some spatial adjacency graph. Then you define some spatial autocorrelation statistic that takes this general form. The general idea is that you have um, C, which describes a relationship between the, um, the, the two cells, and then W, which describes the distance between them. So in effect, we're just taking like a cross product um, between the distance in expression space to the distance in uh, physical space. We can then test the statistic versus the null, and then for every pair of cell types, um, say something about whether they are uh, more likely to be in the vicinity of each other or not. Um, if we then um, look closer at some of these uh, relationships we found, well, firstly, we find again, you know, these light red cells uh, here, which are our enterocyte cells that tend to be found inside of large tumor glands when we compare them to the HNE. Um, and another example is these orange cells that tend to be more localized with stroma than the other epithelial cells. And we find that they are enriched near large stromal rivers and that we can see that um, they, uh, uh, and, and, and when we looked in um, our, so just I showed you um, our fresh frozen data. When we look at our FFP data, we also see something similar and we can validate this using IHC. So here we have a pretty nice staining that shows that um, the expression, uh, the protein expression actually matches the gene expression. Of course, we can look beyond just the epithelial cells. We can also look in the TME. One very strong co-localization signal we found was uh, between these cancer-associated fibroblasts and endothelial cells. Um, and uh, this is a different way of looking at the data. We can just compare their spatial densities and see that they're extremely similar, which seems to suggest that these cancer-associated fibroblasts maybe have some pro-angiogenic function, uh, similar to VCAFs that have been described um, in other studies. Another thing we could do, for example, is to compare the spatial densities of different types of immune cells. So here we're going to focus on monocytes that are C1QA+, versus monocytes that are SPP1+, and we actually see that they have very different spatial distributions. So the C1QA+, monocytes in particular, we found to be significantly co-localized with CAFs that were expressing MMP11, while the SSPP1 monocytes actually tend to be closer to epithelial cells and found deeper within tumor networks which maybe suggests that they are involved in maybe cleaning up debris. Um, finally, a lot of the cellular neighborhoods I showed you so far are pretty small scale, but actually we can also discover these larger spatial neighborhoods within our tumors. So um, in these examples, uh, on the left I have one tumor where we're seeing very strong bimodal expression of mucin-associated genes, while on the right uh, we have strong bimodal expression of specific stem-related genes. And I think you know, this really highlights that there are um, biologically coherent spatial units across the different spatial length scales and it is really important and also challenging to study them. So in summary, um, in the study, we've looked at over 6 million cells from 33 patients and 74 samples across um, diverse CRC molecular subtypes. Um, we've carried out an iterative clustering analysis um, that you know, has a spatial flare um, that identifies cell types and states concordant with SCRNA-seq. We took these cell types and we mapped them back into physical space. Um, we found that you know, the cells become extremely and sadly disorganized in cancer, but at the same time, their spatial organization in cancer is non-random. In fact, molecular markers related to biological processes such as stem cell renewal and response to hypoxia still exhibit very specific spatial patterning within and across the tumor glands and reflect gland morphology. Finally, I think spatial omics technologies poses new challenges and opportunities beyond cell typing for atlasing. Um, and one of those challenges is going beyond just identifying cell types and actually describing um, bi meaningful biological units across different spatial length scales. So this work could not have been possible without the hard work of many, many people from the Sean Prabhakar, Ian Tan, and Chen Kok Hao Labs. Um, thank you all for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions.
Yeah, very nice talk, Grace. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, really nice work. I was wondering, is there something that you gain uh, by defining neighborhoods uh, that you would not otherwise get by your k-means clustering? So, for example, you showed mucin to expression. Do you see that mucin to expression is not otherwise cluster specific already? Uh, so, exactly, what is what is the gain and um, second question on follow up, following up on that, do you see that the neighborhoods are uh, more than, again, what the clusters are showing you in terms of things which might not be close in the embedding that you see in the UMAP mm -hmm. are actually close together in neighborhoods in the form that they are showing or representing some other underlying relationships that are not captured otherwise. Okay, so um, maybe if I understand your first question, oh, sorry, what was it again? <laughs> um, uh, okay, you were asking about what do we gain from this, correct? Okay, so I think what we gain from this and what I haven't showed you is, of course, what we want to know is that if we see, for example, uh, intratumoral homo uh, heterogeneity of mucin expression, are those associated with specific different, other different cell types? Like, are there is it being driven by, is the differences being driven by the local tumor microenvironment or by genetic causes? Um, and that um, has therapeutic implications because it tells us, you know, whether or not modulation of the tumor microenvironment is important. So I think um, maybe that um, is trying to answer your first question, tells us a little bit about, you know, not just about the the distribution of cell types that are in the things, but the distribution of cell types, not just globally, but locally. Um, and that tells us something about um, interactions. Um, and then I think your second question, which could, could sorry, could you remind me so, again? So is it possible to extract each neighborhood that you uh, define? Yes. So for example, with mucin, if I would like to make a statement yeah. about the microenvironment, mm -hmm. do I, can I make a statement with your tool, uh, Banksy, to say that, okay, in one case, I see mucin always associated with like certain big number of microenvironments with certain characteristics sure. versus... Yeah, so I, I think the idea is that a neighborhood is formed by many different cell types that are, um, you know, together performing or um, giving rise to some biological phenomena. So I think, you know, one way I think about it is that individual genes do specific things, so individual cells do specific things, but a collection of genes might do, might carry out some higher order function, and so some uh, collection of cells that are, you know, within some spatial proximity of each other might be um, giving rise to some specific biological phenomena in that region. Um, and I think, you know, but I, I, I think, you know, it still remains a challenge of how to, you know, actually, we can, we can find these things, um, are they biologically meaningful? I think is a question that is still something that we um, struggle with. Thank you. Thank you. And more questions? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, good talks. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, corrector cancer uh, have uh, differences between right side corrector cancer and left side corrector cancer. Uh, so my question is, uh, did you uh, observe the data of differences in your spatial analysis like uh, cell type distributions or uh, something like that? Um, I couldn't hear you very clearly. Are you asking about left versus right? Uh, differences uh, about, uh, differences in right side sample or left side sample uh, mm -hmm. ascending cone or uh, descending yeah. cone. So we've collected samples from both, um, but um, I think right now we still we're still doing some ongoing work to actually do comparisons of the spatial uh, organizations between um, the different. Um, the different subtypes. We haven't really done that yet. So, so far, mostly what I've described is phenomena that we're seeing um, either across um, all, of this, all of our samples or 
um, unique to a specific sample. Mm -hmm. But I think that's you know definitely the next step. Thank you. Thank you. So our third speaker is uh, Professor Shangamitra Bandabadhyay. She is the director of uh, Indian Statistical Institute and a prolific researcher in many areas. Uh, including, of course, single cell analysis. Uh, she is probably talking on clustering of single cell data. So, Professor Bondavat, you have 20 minutes, including question and answer. Uh, good afternoon. I am Shangamitra Bondopadhyay from the Indian Statistical Institute, and today I'm going to speak on clustering single cell RNA seq data, some work that we've been doing for the last four or five years now. Uh, before I go into the talk, very quickly, I know I'm stretch for time, but very quickly I'll just tell you a little bit about the Indian Statistical Institute, which was established in 1931 by Professor Prashanta Chandra Mahalanobis. And uh, many of us use the Mahalanobis distance invented by him in many of our respective domains. And also not many people know, <clears throat> but the first computer in India came to the Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata. This institute is in the northern fringes of the city and we are spread all over the country, headquartered in Kolkata, but we have centers in many different places, including Delhi, Bangalore, and our STAR programs, flagship programs are the Bachelor of Statistics, Bachelor of Mathematics, and many other programs which are listed there. With that quick introduction to the Institute, uh, let me go on to my talk. This audience naturally does not need an introduction to single-cell RNA-seq data, the importance of uh, single cell RNA seq is well known to all of us. It provides us an opportunity to identify new cell types, uh, new gene regulatory networks, characterize the heterogeneity in the cells, especially in cancer and many other diseases, study the different the heterogeneity of the cells in early development and tissue differentiation. <coughs> And uh, the re current droplet based uh, SCRNA seq technology produces quite large data sets, uh, many genes and many, many cells. So these are very high dimensional data sets which we have to deal with and therefore they provide uh, many computational challenges. Uh, first of all, the data has a lot of technical noise. There are a lot of missing values. There's low, because of low capture efficiency, because of bias in the various uh, steps of the process of capturing the data. And this, the challenges here necessitates new tools for uh, downstream analysis of this data set. But of course, that is necessary because this data presents such a rich repertoire of information that we cannot miss uh, what this data has to tell us. And the downstream analysis, many different uh, purposes, this can be used for for mapping single cells to reference atlas, for clustering very large data sets, identifying cell types, specific markers, visualization, and so on and so forth. So since I'm going to speak on clustering of uh, single cell RNA-seq data, and this is very high dimensional, very large data sets, what we intend to do, what we've done in the work that we did a few years back, first of all, we want to sample the data and then clustering it, uh, cluster it and then do a post hoc assignment of the remaining data points which were not taken in the sample. So this is the essential um, pipeline, the flow of uh, control in the method which we call drop cluster, and the next version is called drop cluster 2. So we have the input count matrix, we uh, do the filtering of uh, the bad and the uh, bad cells and bad genes, which we define in certain ways. And then we also do a first level of gene selection, looking at some uh, dispersion factor. We have also in the second version of this algorithm taken, eff taken into account the batch effect, which often confounds the analysis. So that is very important because data is taken at different time points in different machines, etc. So there are batch effects and that has to be uh, distinguished between the biological signals, the signals which are there. After that, we do this structure preserving sampling. That is the key part of this clustering method. The structure preserving sampling, which actually helps to retain very small clusters. And in 
uh, those who are working in single cell uh, data analysis, we know that there are rare cell types, very few cells are there which need to be detected. So this structure preserving sampling using something called locality sensitive hashing, which I'll come to in the next few slides, uh, that helps in preserving those small clusters. Then we do a principal component analysis, but we bring in some change there, I'll also tell that. And then normal clustering and then do the post hoc assignment and of course try to show the data, show the clusters how it is coming out. So the pre-processing we just uh, remove those cells in which very few genes have expressed themselves and remove those genes uh, which are expressed in very few cells, very very few cells. So there are some thresholds we set, this is the first level of cleaning up the data. Then we do certain normalization, uh, we use the median based normalization and then pick using a measure which is called the FANO factor which essentially is a ratio between the variance and the mean. So using that FANO factor we select the top thousand genes. So that's where we start and we uh, then log normalize the data. Then as I said we use something called locality sensitive hashing. Uh, now hashing in computer science we know that we hash things to different we try to avoid collisions we hash different records different key values uh, and try to design the hash function in such a way that collision meaning two different key values colliding going to the same hash taking the hash, same hash value that is avoided because essentially hashing the purpose of hashing was quick retrieval of data so we want to spread out the data in such a way so that as soon as we take, we have a query, we look at the key value of that query, apply the hash function and we should be able to go directly to the data, order one search. Uh, that is what the principle of hashing is. So points should be spread out as far as possible. This is the general hashing principle. But locality sensitive hashing here, we want those points which are close together in the original space to actually collide. We design the hash function in such a way that local points, they collide and go to the same bucket. So this is the purpose of locality sensitive hashing. And it has found its application in many, many different places. It was developed in 2006 and has been used quite widely thereafter. We do the hashing in a particular way, which, um, which is very simple. Uh, I will not have time to de describe the method, but it is essentially, we take a set of three random, let's say three random lines and project the data points on this. So every data point would have a binary string associated with it, depending on which side of the three lines uh, this point lies. This gives us one bucket, 101, for the, this set of three lines. This process is repeated multiple times so that finally the hash function which we arrive at, it will sort of ensure that points which are close together are all mapped to the same bucket. Not If you do it once, then you will have a lot of errors. You have to repeat this multiple times. Now, with that, what we do is a locality sensitive uh, hashing based sampling. We sample the data, we sample the cells in such a way using this hashing function. So use, uh, what happens is the structure gets preserved. I would like to draw your attention to this small cluster over here. As you can see, using this locality sensitive hashing and sampling uh, with that, we are able to still retain very small groups of data. That was the major uh, uh, or the most important part of this algorithm. If you do a random sampling, then this part tends to get lost. Maybe one point will come from there, but that's not enough. So this, uh, what we do is we sample from the different buckets which the hashing results in, and then the sampling is inversely proportional to the size of the bucket, meaning if there are only few points, we try to retain as many of them, but if the bucket contains a large number of points, we downsample quite heavily over there. Then, as I said, what we do is we bring in an innovation in the principal component analysis. We do the normal PCA, but PCA essentially captures the variance of the data. Uh, 
what we do is we look at the different principal components, we project the data on the different principal components and then fit Gaussian distributions there and find out how many modes are detected. So essentially you will see along this principal component for example, this is the second principal component, two modes that will be detected, one for this and one for this, this part here, right, oh it is not showing. So uh, along this principal component, two modes would be detected, one for this part and uh, one for the other. But the first principal component is this, wh which you will detect only one mode, while for the second principal component, you will detect two modes. And since our objective is to you know, separate out the data sets, we prefer this component over this component. So this is the way we sp pick up the top 200 components, principal components, they are not necessarily those with the highest variances. And with that, then we do uh, the hierarchical clustering and after the clustering is done, we um, do a post hoc assignment of the data points. This result quickly on the, sorry, on the PBMC data set actually shows that we are able to detect very small, I don't know whether that is visible here, but very small clusters uh, get detected. Some, uh, something um, we were able to discover CD52 regulatory T cells among the very large data set. Uh, we also applied it to some other, uh, for example, the triple negative breast cancer data set where also we uh, obtained quite interesting results. So that is the clustering result which we, uh, results of the clustering technique which we developed uh, around 2018-2020. Thereafter we took this work forward. Uh, so this is the drop class 2.0, the web server which one can use. Um, uh, now, before concluding, just to tell you a little bit about the recent works that uh, we've been doing, we are focusing on gene selection from single cell RNA-seq data and we've looked at the problem from the supervised framework where we developed certain methods uh, using a measure called copula. And copula, essentially there's this Sklar theorem, uh, it is essentially a way of capturing uh, some information, the correlation between the uh, different features. Uh, it is like mutual information but has better properties than mutual information. Uh, essentially this theorem says that any multivariate joint distribution can be written in terms of univariate marginal distribution functions and a copula which describes the de dependent structure between the variables. Uh, so we've used mo copula to model the dependency between the genes and the class vector, which is actually found to be very useful in the very high dimensional uh, data sets, which single cell RNA-seq data typically are. We've also, uh, we've also developed an entropy guided gene selection method, which is again in the supervised framework. But um, rather than Shannon's entropy, we've actually used some uh, Rennie entropy and Salis entropy measures, which are found to be more robust to noise and uh, RNA uh, single cell data essentially has a lot of noise component in it. Uh, we've done uh, gene selection also in the su unsupervised framework, where we've used, first of all, LSH, the locality sensitive hashing based sampling of genes, followed by copula based cell neighborhood graph construction. So the data is then posed as a graph. And then finally, we use graph convolutional neural networks for clustering in lower dimensional space. And uh, the data typically is very large dimensions, but the number of samples is relatively lower. We need more samples if the data set is so large. So in order to increase the number of samples synthetically, we've actually uh, used um, the uh, generative uh, adversarial network, the GAN network, with locality sensitive hashing and this has actually proved to be quite useful in generating new samples which are very similar to the real data. With that, uh, these, are the, these are some of the references. These two references are the one where we developed the, the drop cluster which I described in brief and uh, these are the other works that uh, we continue doing in the lab. And we are also uh, thinking of now going into applications of something called graph neural networks along with 
increasing explainability because explainability is very important uh, for uh, you know convincing the audience, convincing the users that why certain things, why certain results are coming. We are already working with explainability. We have developed a model-centric explainer for graph neural networks, which was published uh, very recently last year in uh, CIKM, which is a fairly good conference. Uh, with that, thank you very much um, for your time. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And I acknowledge my group here, which helped me, uh, which did the work, actually, the groundwork, everything done by uh, my student, uh, former student, now a faculty member at IIIT Delhi, Devarko Sengupta, and others. Uh, I also acknowledge my institute and all my funding agencies, including the Department of Biotechnology, which funded a, the part of the work that I described. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vandavadha, for a fantastic talk, having many components for future research, I believe. So if you have any question, please, uh, we have some time. So any question? Uh, Shagamitra, nice to see the scalability of the methods, um, like drop last. I was intri intrigued or uh, interested in uh, how scalable the feature selection method was, the copula-based feature selection method. If you have to calculate the copula for like all genes versus all genes, that's quite expensive, that, especially for large data sets. Right, right. So uh, in the drop class, there is no copula. Copula right. came only later. Exactly. Uh, I'm talking about feature selection. Yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah, in the feature selection. So what we were doing is essentially uh, the copula measure was taken from between the between the gene and the class label. So it was not, not uh, gene, gene. pairwise, okay, not all. Okay. Uh, but, but then uh, that's feature sele supervised feature se selection then, right? So Yeah. Uh, in the unsupervised part, uh, it was not for the full set. We'd already reduced the genes to a large extent, number of, uh, re removed a lot of other genes using some pre-processing and other methods, and then we came to the copula part. It okay. would be expensive. Okay, and would that s still work for, say, two million cells, something like that? Mm. No, well, we did uh, two million cells. I, I guess it would, but uh, because we are also incorporating, looking at this LSH, which actually helps quite a bit in um, making these, you know, nearest neighbor computations very fast. So, with that, we've not. Uh, tested for such large, but uh, but the computational complexity is already down when we use this locality sensitive hashing. Uh, it makes life much simpler to do that. So we, well, uh, I have not used it for such large data sets, but uh, looks like it would be better than any other technique which is out there. Absolutely, yeah. Sounds very promising. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You have a question? Yeah. Just one second. Just one second. Great talk. Fantastic. I was wondering, uh, when you are proceeding in this direction, are you also planning to uh, integrate single cell data set and perhaps use something like AI to learn more from that in order to bring in better resolution for the locality hashing? Uh, to bring in AI, uh, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. transcriptomics. Well, using spatial transcriptomics, the data that's already there, yeah. which can guide the way to uh, the, the more localized functions of cells and the more interactive functions of the cells. So it, it certainly could, but these are all uh, machine learning techniques which are using there, which we are using there anyway. So uh, I did not get what you meant by using AI. Yeah, I think AI was a bit bit off, but I'm just saying uh, if spatial transcriptomics can guide this better. It could. Yeah. I am. Uh, I have not looked at spatial transcriptomics. The lecture just before this, the talk yeah. before this, was very interesting. So yes, uh, it certainly could. At least in images, I know that we have used um, uh, not only the intensity value but also because the pixels directly give us this spatial uh, near neighborhood. So that was quite effectively used in uh, doing a better clustering uh, in the image domain. I don't see why not here. Of course it can be, I'm, I'm sure it can be used 
for improving the results. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. One last question, please. Uh, hi, Dr. Bandhavadi. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, just a very quick question. When you hash, when you run the hash, in terms of when you do the sampling within those hashes, are all cells treated sam uh, uniformly? Do you do a uniform sampling? Or is there a score assigned to each of those cells within those hashes? So this, this, actually... this picked up your voice only much later. What was the first part of your question? Yeah, my first part of the question was when you do, the ha when you do hashing, there's only one part actually, which is when you do the hashing, do you sample within those hashes uniformly? Or is there no. a score? No, 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 no. That is what, I mean, you mean sample from the buckets? So sample that from the buckets. That the points hash to? Yeah. Yeah. No, not uniformly, uh, not at all. It's actually inversely proportional to the number of points in that bucket. Uh, but so within those cells that you'll select, those do not have a score, so they are... Uh, no, 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 okay. yes, okay. you're right. Okay. Within that bucket, no, then we, it's, it's just uniform sampling, yeah. And have you played around with the total size in terms of scalability? I think this question was asked earlier. Yes, also. we have played around a little bit, but uh, with the size of the data set, you mean? Yeah, uh, so how, do, how does LSH scale with uh, millions of cells in terms of no, in, uh, Not here, but in other domains, LH, LSH scales quite well, actually. I see. So it, it actually scales quite well. In other domains, we've um, used it for very large data sets. Uh, but not, not in this particular domain. Okay. But and it scales very well. Okay, thank you. And uh, one final question, which is, uh, do you have an insight about the number of features and how does that play around with uh, your downstream processing or downstream clustering? How stable is it based on 1,000 features versus 3,000 features and so on? So uh, you mean starting from, uh, so selecting 1,000 features versus selecting 3,000 or starting from 1,000 features and then going down and starting from 3,000 uh, going down? What do you mean? So I'm assuming the clustering is done on 1,000 features that you eventually select on, mm. in the PC space. If I were to select with 2,000 or 3,000 features, would the clusters be stable enough or does, do you see a lot of uh, shuffling around? Uh, we did with 200. Okay. After PC principal component analysis, we took... 200 features. Uh, we've not gone up to 3,000 because I think we would have, uh, the, the purpose was to bring it down to a lower dimensional space. But uh, 200 itself is quite large. So we have not really tested what you, uh, the question that you're asking, we've not tested that. But I guess the performance would become poorer. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so thank you again, Professor Bandavadha, for a nice talk. So please give Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So our next speaker and the last speaker of this session is uh, Dr. Diniti Sumanavira, right? So she is a postdoc in Shara Tishman's lab in Sanger Institute. Uh, she'll be talking on probably working on computational models in various issues in single cell data analysis. Okay. So y y you have 20 minutes time, including question answer. 20. 20 minutes, including question and um, Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Diniti, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow from the Teichman Lab at the Welcome Sanger Institute. Today, I'm going to talk about gene level alignment of single cell trajectories. So, this is one of the machine learning projects we've been doing in, in the lab, uh, specifically because as we know, there are many data sets in the human cell atlas and in the literature that have explicit or implicit time information. Uh, that means they capture single cell trajectories, such as um, cell, cell differentiation trajectories, uh, which represent dynamic processes. So it's very important that along this time dimension, we are able to compare different data sets. For example, when we have a new query data set, how do we actually compare them against the reference data set? Um, so these are coming up in different contexts. Uh, for example, there are three different uh, instances here, in vivo versus in vitro, um, control versus treatment, or healthy versus disease. So many of these contexts have, been co have come up uh, in, during the talks in this meeting as well. So I think it would be great to actually focus on these uh, different comparison scenarios. But mainly, uh, what we're looking at is how do we actually compare two different single cell trajectories when we have a reference R and a query Q. This is a pairwise comparison. 
And what the main question is how to quantify similarity. And the usual approach we are looking at is computational alignment. So what I mean by computational alignment is a sequential mapping or a discrete nonlinear mapping between pseudo time points of a trajectory R and trajectory Q. So in this case, you can see that there are different time points being matched. Uh, some are one to one, some are one to many, and then there are also time points that are mismatched. So that represents the similar and dissimilar portions along the time between the trajectories. So in essence, we can actually divide this into five different states of alignment. Uh, one uh, class is the match class, where we have three different states, a one-to-one -one corresponding match, uh, where you can see one-to-one -one time point matching, and then one to many, many to one time point matching. And this is often coming up uh, in the notion of warps that you, ha you are seeing in the time series domain. Uh, if you have heard of dynamic time warping, that's an algorithm which goes with this notion and handles matches and warps. And then separately, we also have two different states that define mismatches, and they are co coming as insertions and deletions, and what we often see in sequence alignment, in protein DNA sequence alignment, uh, it, it, they are in the form of gaps representing mismatches. So ideally, when we have a sequential mapping between pseudo time points uh, of two different trajectories, we can explain them as a five-state string, uh, where you saw the, all the possible five states earlier. So in this case, we have uh, the, 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 the beginning. At the beginning, there are some mismatches for the query time points, and then it starts to get matched in the reference and query. So you see insertions at first, and then it's followed by matches and warps. And then again, you see mismatches as insertions and deletions. So again, matches, and finally, uh, mismatches again. So this can be a way to quantify the similarity between two trajectories. It could be the percentage of matched time point pairs between them. So the step one of generating this kind of a mapping is uh, first to discretize the pseudo time axis. So axis discretization can be done as equivalent binning, uh, and then we can sort of get an interpolated uh, trend of expression data along those lines to get the comparison. And then step two is to run an alignment algorithm to find the optimal mapping. So this algorithm needs a scoring scheme to quantify the similarity between two time points, uh, especially in terms of the gene expression if you are using that data set. Uh, and then an optimization strategy to um, or maximize the similarity between the trajectories, and that is usually done via dynamic programming. And there are two di different directions that we can have a look uh, at the alignment. First direction is high dimensional alignment, where we are just considering all the genes uh, to do this alignment, and for example, optimizing the Euclidean distance of the gene expression uh, at each time point. Uh, and coming up with a single alignment. Uh, the second direction, which is of focus in this talk, is the gene level alignment, where we have uh, per, ally per gene alignment. And this is important because different genes match and mismatch along the time at different time points. And that is, uh, which means that we, can, we could have 100% matching genes and 100% mismatching genes. And also, some genes could be early mismatching and late matching, uh, and vice versa. So there are different groups of genes with different alignment patterns, which will be of interest, especially if we are to analyze differential expression along the, uh, along the time dimension. So if we have a look at existing alignment approaches, uh, most of them focusing on cell level alignment, which is the high dimensional alignment that I mentioned earlier, the direction one, which is not gene level. And you, the, the most common uh, approach is dynamic time warping, which was originated from the time series domain, and then it was applied uh, by Alpert uh, at, uh, and colleagues uh, in 2018 uh, under cell align framework. And the, the limitation of this alignment method is that it assumes that 
every point po time point matches to at least one time point. So what you get here is a complete mapping. It just matches and warps. So there is no handling of uh, insertions and deletions. Uh, and the other existing alignment approach is coming from a separate domain, which is the DNA or protein sequence alignment domain, which handles the matches uh, of one to one and the insertions and deletions, but not the warps. Um, so, for example, the, the popular Needleman Wunsch algorithm. But how do we get both matches and mismatches together is the, the big question because in trajectories we, we have all these five different states. Um, so one approach is to get the dynamic time warping alignment output, the mapping, and then do some pruning or post-processing of the time point pairs to disconnect the time points that are much dissimilar. So this was done in a very recent advancement to the cell align, uh, which is called tragedy. Uh, but it has limitations because this is ad hoc thresholding. We don't know the exact threshold to go, to go for the dissimilarity scoring. And then this is mainly uh, aimed at high dimensional alignment. And there is also no sort of clustering of genes to identify different groups of alignment patterns in different genes. So we came up with a new alignment approach, which actually combines the dynamic time warping algorithm and the biological sequence alignment algorithm to handle all these five different alignment states. And this is specifically uh, taking advantage of the Goto's uh, sequence alignment algorithm, which has a quadratic uh, time complexity uh, when using a gap uh, scheme, which is a find. That means we can have a gap open and gap extension penalty. And uh, we call our approach as genes to genes. And there is no ad hoc thresholding now because the algorithm unifies uh, dynamic time warping and gap modeling. And then this does gene level alignment and does clustering of genes as well. And uh, this is actually a Bayesian information theoretic framework. I won't go into more technical details. If you're interested, you can actually see this as in our preprint available on BioArchive. Uh, but to, just to give a uh, gist, uh, what we're doing is when we are matching two time points, uh, we are taking into consideration the gene expression distributions rather than the mean expression so that we can take into account the sample variability within uh, the system as well. So it's a distribution-wise similarity scoring, not just a mean-based uh, scoring. Uh, so the input to the genes to genes framework are just the cell by gene matrices from a reference and query data set. You just need to have log 1p normalized gene expression along with pseudo time estimates. So we can, have, we can run any uh, available pseudo time estimate uh, algorithm to estimate the pseudo time for each cell and then input to into genes to genes. And then genes to genes will run for a given gene set. For each gene, it will run the dynamic programming algorithm, which is unifying the dynamic time warping and gap modeling under a Bayesian information theoretic framework. So the output of gene Genes to genes is gene level alignment. So for each gene, you would get the five state, defin uh, five state uh, description of the alignment, like this, along with the alignment similarity statistics computed. We are also computing an average high level alignment across all these uh, gene level alignments as well, so that we can have an average idea of what's happening in, uh, along the time points. Uh, and then finally, we can also get the gene clusters by clustering these five states alignment strings. Uh, so some can be 100% matching, some can, can be completely mismatching like this, or mismatch at the beginning and mismatch at the end and so on. So there could be different alignment patterns. Uh, with genes to genes, we uh, sort of applied this to a case study where we compared two uh, systems in vitro, in vivo. The first system is the query system is artificial thymus organoid, which was grown in house in, in the lab uh, by Dr. Chen Chu Suo, who is a clinical research fellow in the lab. So this was uh, a T cell differentiation protocol where T cells were uh, grown from iPSCs all the way up to single positive T cells, um, all, all across nine to ten weeks, roughly. And then we take uh, to, for comparison, we take the in vivo reference from fetal T-cell development atlas published in science. 
Um, and this is covering only hematopoietic stem cells all the way up to type 1 innate T cells in the in vivo reference. Uh, just to give you an idea of this trajectory, when uh, the T cells are differentiating, they go from the stem cell stages and go uh, across different uh, st uh, stages in cell state, the double negative, double positive, alpha, beta, T entry, and all the way up to single positive T cells. So that's the sort of the single lineage that we are looking at. And then we fed these two different data sets, and we estimated pseudo time for these uh, data sets using Gaussian process latent variable model uh, and an approximation uh, using the SCVI latent embedding for integrating the reference and query together. And then finally, we aligned these two data sets in terms of 1,371 transcription factors and fi find out what are the gene level alignments. And this was the average alignment across um, the time points, where we, we see that there's a mismatch at the beginning uh, between the in vivo and in vitro, uh, and also mismatch at the end. So the beginning mismatch makes sense, because the pluripotency stage, which is present in the organoid, is not present in the in vivo reference. So therefore, many genes are mismatching at the early stages. And then for the, the last stage, there, that sort of implies that there sh can be some sort of a difference in the maturity level of the T cells. Uh, being generated by the in vivo versus in vitro reference. So if we look at some pluripotent stem cell uh, regulation-related genes, we see that there are significant early mismatches that had been sort of captured by the genes-to-genes -genes framework. Um, and then also there are genes that are... So if you take the, all the differentially, highly differentially expressed genes, most of them are actually coming on the TNF alpha signaling uh, where NF kappa beta pathway. That is what we sort of identify. Uh, because these genes under this pathway were having very significant less mismatches. For example, in here you can see like KLF2, um, Jun B, and so on. So this was one of the findings that we had uh, by applying genes to genes. Uh, and this showcase that we can actually identify pathways and also pinpoint time points where the di these differences occur in time when you do alignment, uh, trajectory alignment at gene level. So in summary, gene level trajectory alignment is a very important task, a computational task that we can apply to compare reference and query data sets along the time dimension. And this actually uh, serves for differential expression analysis across time in a much statistically consistent and robust way. And finally, we, are, we have developed this Python package called genes to genes for doing this at gene level. Uh, it is a Bayesian information theoretic alignment framework, which you can freely use. And it's available at our GitHub repository and the preprint available at the bioarchive at the moment. So this work was possible due to many people, um, especially uh, the, with the guidance from Professor Sarah Teichman and Dr. Chen Chu Suo as well. And everyone who I have mentioned here, they, uh, they were greatly helpful in discussions and the work carried out. So I, I would like to thank everyone here and also the Human Cell Atlas uh, to, for giving me the opportunity to talk uh, today and present our work. Uh, and finally, thank you so much for your attention and happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Shivanavira, for a fantastic talk. So, any questions? Uh, if you have any questions, please. Hello, great talk. Thanks a lot. Uh, just curious about, uh, I think it would be great application would be comparing developmental biology of, say, the brain and the, the brain organoids, for example, to understand and have a better prediction of gestation stages of organoid development to actual embryo embryogenesis. Any, any thoughts or, or have, you, have you compared these two to have a better estimate of how real or how accurate the organoid systems are? 
Um, so that, that's one of the greatest applications that we're aiming at. So for the moment, we only uh, compare the time as organoid with the reference, but there is a potential for comparing different organoid types and to see how accurately they um, follow the dynamics of the in vivo. And if we can actually take the mismatched genes into account and see if we can rectify the protocol uh, by actually adding the factors that rectify those ex uh, differences. So that's a great application which uh, we look forward to s uh, see uh, like if uh, anyone in, in the group who is uh, interested in doing uh, brain organoid comparisons, any group, research group, uh, that would be great to see how they would use this tool. Yeah. Because yeah. th that was my follow-up question is to if you can extract transcription factors or other factors that can facilitate. But yeah, it'd be great to test that in the lab. Thanks. Yes, yes. So, so for the, uh, I, I can uh, note that um, the TNF alpha pathway that we found, the, so there were diff many different late mismatches. So what we did was as a preliminary study, we added TNF alpha to the protocol to see if there's a difference. So this is a preliminary analysis only, and we saw that some of the single positive T-cell markers were increasing the maturity levels. So it was doing something different. So I think that's a good potential direction to follow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other question? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, so I believe we don't have any question. Again, thank you, Dr. Sona Veera. Thank you. And let's thank all the speakers in this session. So this is the end of this session.